I'm actually going to say I'm a little bit of an interloper in that I'm not really a professor of religions, but more of Chinese cultural history and um, literature. But I'm more coming at this uh, project from sort of the point of view of trying to understand um, some aspects and, and work with some aspects of, of East Asian religion and culture from the point of view of the digital humanities. And one of the big factors in that is creating good quality data and making it available to people. And so I want to kind of talk through today some of the basics of the data that we have, the metadata that uh, describes it, and the interfaces through which um, people access, users access the material, um, in part to give you, especially if you're potentially going to be a participant in a field visit with Frogbear, um, some direction in terms of what the ultimate output is going to be. But some of that will also be useful for really any kind of uh, digital humanities project in um, really any discipline. Um, some of these will be very transferable skills, we hope. Um, so as Vicky has already outlined uh, very briefly, the, the project um, has gone through um, an initial phase when there were three years of, uh, three summers basically of field visits, which collected data in different parts of East Asia. There were supposed to be ones in 2020 and 2021. Um, those obviously the pandemic has made impossible, but um, we are looking to continue to collect data um, next year and we'll see um, what happens um, in the future. But um, we already have, quite a bit of material. Um, so we have currently uh, material collected by the uh, cluster visits that amounts to 903 records. Um, each record is um, a, an entry basically in the library's database or that contains one or more electronic objects. An electronic object is more or less a file a video, an image, it could be a text file or a data file like a spreadsheet. Of those, the vast majority contain one or more images. 895 have images. 124 contain videos of different kinds. Um, so some of those are um, drone footage. Some of them are things like what we call photo photospheres where uh, people take a series of photos to create a uh, 3D panorama. Um, and those can also vary quite a bit in what they contain. So uh, some of them you might think of as more raw, simply documenting what's at a site um, or in a document. Um, others have been kind of produced for uh, Frogbear. So things like uh, videos with editing and narration, like a short documentary. Um, so you might use those in um, different ways. Um, and I encourage you, as well, I'll show you the interfaces that we use for Frogbear and, and to kind of go and explore because there's more than I can summarize in um, just a couple of minutes. Um, so what's important about this data is that it and all the metadata describing it are open, public, and reusable under a Creative Commons attribution license, um, which means that anyone can access it publicly. You don't need an account. Um, that it can be reused for um, any purpose um, as long as you maintain the attribution so you show where it came from. Um, it's all stored on UBC library servers, which means that there are stable and unique identifiers for each record. So if you want to cite it, um, there's a very clear URL that will not change as long as the UBC library continues to exist and the World Wide Web continues to exist. Um, so we don't know how long that will be, but it should be a pretty long time. Um, all this material can be accessed in two different ways. So one is through the UBC library itself, and the other is through a website that Frogbear has created um, called the Frogbear Database of Religious Sites in East Asia, which you can access um, at the link here, frogbear.org you know, slash APP. Um, and I'll show you both of those um, and a little bit about them uh, here. 
So on the left is our Frog Bear interface and on the right, the UBC Open Collections. They're both different ways into our data. And um, I wanna talk through a little bit about the differences between the two. So different users might actually use both um, in different ways for different purposes. But for the most part, I think for most people, the Frog Bear interface will be um, the way in. The Frog Bear interface has access only to Frog Bear material, whereas the library has all kinds of other things in it, um, which means that you have to kind of narrow things down sometimes depending on how you come in to search. Um, another advantage of uh, the Frog Bear interface is that you can create an account, it's very easy. Um, there's a link at the top of the page to do that and make your own lists of things, which is really helpful for research purposes, for the classroom, whether you are a, an instructor and want to give your students a list of objects that you think are interesting, or you want to assign students to collect material and uh, share a list with you. It's also sort of designed around the frog bear material itself. So there are some specific categories that are really useful for our purposes, like um, organizing it by the different research clusters, uh, by region, and perhaps most importantly, it maps and understands the geographic data that we have. So most of our data is keyed to a spatial location, and um, this can display that location on a map. Um, one of the downsides, as I mentioned, the UBC library is um, permanent. Its records are archival. They should last indefinitely. Um, our interface will try to keep going as long as we can, um, as long as the web technology allows it. Um, as long as the project has um, some funding, but for a permanent home, the library is uh, more reliable. Um, the library also does allow a little bit more uh, flexibility in certain kinds of searches. If you want to get really fancy with Booleans, ands, ors, nots, um, or even fancier with what's called an API, meaning you can basically write a program that accesses this data and sorts it and um, reorganizes it in very complex ways um, or keeps updating itself, you can do all of that through the library. Um, but for most purposes, I think the frog bear interface will be the way um, most of us work. Um, so this is the basic um, interface. Many of you may already have uh, seen it um, with search at the top and results continuously updated on the bottom. Um, there's a big free text search area, and as you type, the results are updated. Um, so with each letter inputted, um, they keep getting um, updated and, and narrowed down. And this is just an example. If I'm um, searching in the free text search area up on the, the top here, you can see if I type Guanyin, um, it will, with each letter, update itself and the search results will uh, narrow down to now there are 21 results, um, all containing Guanyin somewhere in the entry. And this is where thinking about metadata and the structure of metadata starts to be important because this means it's somewhere in the entry, um, but it could be in the title as in the first uh, item here, or it could be um, somewhere else in the description. Um, for a more precise search um, or a more uh, perhaps a narrower search, we can instead use keywords. And these will be things that have been marked as keywords by the people who created that record. So if I search for Guanyin here, actually, um, nothing comes up. So no one has put Guanyin as a keyword for any entries. Um, I do find something if I search for Guanyin's Japanese name, Kanon, or Sanskrit name, Avalokiteshvara, and I can add both those to the search and find three records. So this is where it's important to understand a little bit about the structure of the data in order to understand how you're interacting with it. So what is found as a keyword is only what somebody has marked as a keyword. And um, looking ahead to talking about the specific fields, you'll see why. Um, thinking about where to put these terms is important. Um, so the material that you get as a search result, you can see here, um, can be displayed in three different modes. So the default mode when you open the page um, 
will be to show um, a list like this, but there you can switch at this uh, area up uh, the top between showing a list, showing thumbnails, and showing a map. And the map will show the results of your search or all the records, if that's what you've, uh, if you're at the starting page, um, with their locations on the map that is interactive. So both the um, area on the left that shows the search results, you can interact with that and uh, view those records, and the area on the right where you can look at the map, zoom in, and look for records in a particular area um, and um, or zoom out, you can um, interact with both of those. And there's no, um, there's no way to do that on the library side. So that's one of the values of um, this frog bear interface. So if you open um, one of these individual records, you'll see certain key data um, with the title at the top front and center, the uh, cluster, the research cluster that uh, added this record, and um, a link to the same material, the same record in the UBC library. And then the main part of the record here is the media viewer where you can view um, images, videos that are part of um, this record. In a few cases, there is video or other material like an Excel spreadsheet that's in a format that is not readable, uh, displayable by the viewer. So you have to go and simply directly download it and open it up on your own um, computer. Then below that is the description that, uh, so the title is repeated and then the description. And that as uh, Tara will be introducing in her uh, next presentation um, is one of the key parts of the material because that is an important um, metadata, piece of metadata for anyone trying to understand what is this picture or to find it since a lot of the words are going to be um, found through a search that comes up with this record. Um, and then some additional information about location, um, the creators, meaning the people who took the pictures, um, and a unique identifier, a, a DOI, a permanent link, um, a handle and a uh, citation box, um, though I should uh, warn you that um, there's currently seems to be a bug in the citation box on the interface page, so it's best to go to the UBC library link and view the citation, uh, create the citation there. Um, and then at the bottom here, just a reminder of the um, Creative Commons license on all our material. Um, so if we go and do the same record in the open collections in the library, we'll see the same material, but organized a little bit differently. So the title appears at the top, but um, the next bit of information is the creators or authors of this record. Um, and the, um, the image viewer is set up a little bit differently with the thumbnails on top. Um, but it works largely the same way. Um, you can also see that they're numbered. Um, and that is important because sometimes the description will key the uh, numbers to the individual images. So if we scroll down to the metadata that's provided, um, you can see the same information, but organized a little bit differently. And so, for example, the geographic location with latitude and longitude are listed, but not displayed on a map because the library system doesn't basically parse, it doesn't understand um, geographic data. And the um, cluster information, for example, is fit into an existing category for the library's uh, descriptions of things called series, um, which is maybe not quite where you would um, expect to find it. One of the main reasons for going to the library, if you're coming from the interface, is that you can then go to the um, that full record and access the original file, so the full size files. If you want to um, download them for research purposes, if you want to include them in a PowerPoint um, or a publication, um, you want to go get the full uh, full size version. Um, that's where you can access them. Some of them are quite large, especially. Uh, the video files. Um, so the version you're seeing through the viewer might be um, not quite um, 
the, the same full quality. Um, I won't go through the details of searching by the UBC library, but um, you can do similar kinds of searches, um, but it's not so much designed around our data in particular. So you can start with this and I'll, and I'll share this PowerPoint so everyone can simply get this link, but um, you can access the, um, all the material and do some filtering, for example, by date uh, quite, quite easily. Um, all of this is possible because of the metadata that has been created by the clusters in the course of their field visits and in subsequent sort of editing as we worked with the library to put it all together. So metadata, um, and, and again, Tara's presentation next, we'll go through this in more detail, is data about data. It's description of what you have. So if we take a sample record that is a bunch of photos without any kind of metadata, we just have some images. And they might be great, they might be useful, they might be informative to somebody, but if they don't have any description, then nobody will be able to find them easily. And if they do find them, they won't know what to do with them, what, sent, what to make of them. So that's where our metadata is helpful. Um, and by metadata, we actually mean a couple of, of different things. So some kinds of metadata are you're actually very familiar with and you use all the time, um, but may have somewhat limited usage. So for example, the title, the file name, the date it was taken, um, the size of the file, the type of file, these are all important bits of metadata, but they're not particularly useful for our scholarly purposes. Um, what we are more concerned with is identifying what's in the photo, who made the photo or the video and so forth, because one of the things we need to track is who has the copyright to it, which is the person who created it. Um, what place did they come from? And how do we relate this to larger concepts, broader concepts that somebody might be interested in doing research on and then come across this particular record? So all of these are different aspects of the metadata that we'll be collecting. Some of the metadata is also um, more housekeeping things. So we need to keep track of certain basic um, things like file names and so on. But these are the really challenging bits to um, work with and to create in the course of our, um, our research program. So um, where does this metadata come from? And as I said, some of it is automatically generated. So every time you take a picture on your phone, it gets a file name. You don't even see that file name most of the time, but it's a way your computer keeps track of each individual file. It might also automatically record the date and time. And if you have location turned on, it might record the precise location, um, which is a useful piece of, um, of metadata. Other bits uh, are computed more or less automatically. Um, so something like the number of words in a text document is very easy to create, to, uh, to find out algorithmically. A computer can just more or less instantly, Word will tell you your essay is slightly too long and you need to uh, edit out a few words in order to uh, submit this assignment. Um, other approaches include things like crowdsourcing where we put the material out for lots of people to look at and write descriptions of. Um, and that works well for certain things, but our material in the Frog Bear project is a little too specialized for that to be uh, a practical approach. Um, and likewise, some kinds of problems uh, can be addressed by artificial intelligence and machine learning. Um, so Facebook looks at your pictures and uh, rather ominously tells you who appears in them. Um, and there was lots of things that will identify objects and photos and so on. But again, those for our purposes aren't precise enough and aren't specific enough to the kind of material that we're working with to be able to do that now. Um, maybe eventually the kind of material we're collecting will be used to train systems that do that, but we have to do it ourselves um, right now. Um, so generally, the material we're dealing with has to be manually created. Um, the made, metadata has to be created by people. And um, that means you 
um, manually create that. And in particular, it means that it has to be done by someone with some expertise or by a group of people that has a variety of different expertise. And so that expertise can be background knowledge. It can also be the specific experience of being on the site at the, that day when the images or the videos were created and knowing exactly um, what was involved and uh, where you were and so forth. And so all of that is what we're doing in creating metadata for um, our material in the Frog Bear uh, database. Our next presentation is by Tara Stevens Kite, uh, who is uh, works at the UBC Library and has uh, been very helpful to the project since the beginning. So, Tara, I will pass it over to you to talk a bit more about the schema that we use. Hi, thank you. Um, yeah, I'm so pleased to be able to to speak with you all today. Um, I'm just gonna get my my screen going here and. Oops. Let's see if you guys can everyone see that? Okay. It's okay. So, um, hi, my name is uh, Tara Stevens Kite. I'm the digital repository librarian for Circle at the University of British Columbia. And um, I'd like to acknowledge that I'm currently speaking from the traditional unceded territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh Nation where it is very hot and I've turned my fan very low, so I might get quite dewy. Um, so my goal for today, uh, my area of expertise, really centers around helping content creators um, plan and prepare the materials for Circle, the repository specifically. Uh, my goal really is to help ensure that the Frogbear teams in particular share some foundational knowledge um, of what metadata is, why it's important, and in particular, how it impacts how things are made discoverable and preservable through the various platforms that we're seeing. So with that in mind, um, we're going to echo a little bit of what Bruce was mentioning in terms of what metadata is and why um, we need it, and uh, take a bigger look at um, the big picture of this metadata and how um, Circle processes that for um, discoverability and access. And then we're going to spend a little bit of time with some of the tools that we use to build those item records. So, um, For those of you who aren't familiar, Circle is uh, an open access digital repository specifically for the research and teaching outputs of the University of British Columbia and its partners. So our mandate is very similar to other institutional repositories in that um, it's about making material openly accessible and then about preserving it for future generations. So we currently have over 75,000 items. And as Bruce mentioned, around 900 of those are from Frogbear specifically. So um, our repository is a little bit unusual. I think it's actually unique among repositories in that all of our content, which lives in the DSpace repository and all materials from the other repositories in the UBC library, so our special collections, um, our archives, our digital archives, our data, all of that is discoverable through this central portal that we call Open Collections. So you can also find it in Circle, but this is kind of the main discovery platform for all of those repositories. And as Bruce mentioned, um, we do have an API. So we're actually encouraging people, our main goal is to have people not just access this material, but actually reuse it, push it to their websites, and then repackage it for their own purposes, which is what Frogbear has done. So um, as Bruce mentioned, the item records that you see in Frogware, they're first built in DSpace, they're displayed in open collections, and then they're repackaged in the, the database. So what um, one of the things that makes this all possible is um, metadata. So as Bruce mentioned, metadata is information that describes the resource. So it's data about data. And in our case, that's primarily the photos and videos, text and sound. Um, and the majority of Frogbear data is currently photos. Um, I can say that Circle is primarily a text-based repository. So like most repositories, we can take just about any file, but the majority of what we work with is text. And um, that is reflected in a lot of the way that we capture metadata and what's presented there. 
And um, so those are represented by the files that can be viewed and downloaded in the item metadata record. Um, one thing that can be helpful to think about is that uh, metadata is essentially data. So you need to, uh, it needs to be created, it needs to be stored, it needs to be curated, and it needs to be preserved. And it's really what actually um, makes it usable and reusable for people. It was what helps them interpret it and access it, answers those who, what, when, where, why questions. Another thing that can be helpful in terms of framing specifically how we get the metadata into Circle is to think about the different types of metadata. So the descriptive is really where most people spend the most of our time. That's when we're talking about what the thing is and what the context is. That's the enhancement piece that makes it really valuable. That's really where the subject matter expertise is the most essential. Um, the structural metadata is what helps us understand how to find a thing and then how it relates to other materials in the collection. And then the administrative metadata is what helps us to understand how to manage the resource. So Bruce is mentioning um, rights in particular. So there's a Creative Commons metadata embedded in our records so people know what they're able to do with it when they access it. So how that relates specifically is all of these um, pieces of metadata that are represented in those spreadsheets reflect um, our mandates and our goals and what we're actually trying to accomplish as an institutional repository. So that descriptive metadata, as we mentioned, is directly tied to discovery. And so CIRCLE has metadata standards and quality control that are um, relatable to other institutional repositories, but are also scoped for local fields that are reflective of our priorities. And that's what makes it findable in Open Collections and Frogbear. The structural metadata, as I mentioned, is about how, how, we, um, how we find this material. And that's related specifically to our preservation goals. So we have file format guidelines. As I mentioned, we can take any format, but we prefer non-proprietary because that gives us a better chance of actually making the content available long-term. And that directly relates to um, requirements for our preservation pipeline, which is called Archivematica. And um, one of the elements of administrative metadata is around permissions. So if you look through the materials for Frogbear, you'll know that Circle requires a non-exclusive distribution license. And um, that is really just to say that you understand that you're allowing Circle to share the content. Non-exclusive means we don't own it. Um, and you're also allowing us to do what we need to change formats as needed over time to make it preservable. Um, that's tied again to a Creative Commons element, which is really important so people understand how they can interact with the material. That's one of the great values of open access. And then there's the consent of use of image, which again is just showing that people understand uh, what's happening when they participate and what's going to happen to that content in the long term. Um, so again, just to underscore why it's so important is because it's really essential to search and record discovery, as many of you have discovered. Um, the, as the better the metadata, the easier the experience. So if uh, you've all had frustrating experiences when um, the metadata isn't quite what you need it to be. And it's really important for certain types of data or content in particular, like data sets that may not have a lot of context. Um, and you really need to see how it relates to a bigger process, a bigger, bigger methodology. And a lot of that's presented through the metadata. Another useful thing to think about is how we organize metadata. So again, this is gonna be represented in that spreadsheet we'll look at. So those elements and fields are the basic building blocks of metadata descriptions. So the title, the abstract, and then it's the standards that are kind of the rules about how you do data entry for those particular fields. As I mentioned, there's a lot of commonalities across repositories. You'll see title and creator and date in a lot of repositories. And then you'll see some unique things about how we capture um, affiliations or scholarly level. And that's kind of connected to the schema about how we use our metadata. And that's also connected to how metadata is used for Frogbear. It's the particular language for those projects. And then there's controlled vocabularies. So those are standardized and organized sets of terms. Um, Circle does use some controlled vocabularies 
but there's a lot of flexibility in how um, you can do data entry for many of these, these fields. So this is a, a snapshot of the, um, the template that we'll be using. I'm just gonna go, I've gotten ahead of my notes for a second, make sure I'm on space. So um, I just wanna break it down a little bit to show you um, what these different sections mean. And the first thing I wanna point out are all these signposts where we're getting instructions on how it can be used. So in that top corner, we're letting you know that um, there are repeatable fields. So there are some examples where you can only enter one value. So an example would be a date. We generally don't have multiple dates in a specific field. We're trying to just say, what's the date the thing was created? Um, we're also letting you know that you can use double pipes to separate values, and that's directly translatable to how we get the content into the repository. It helps us make it machine readable. At the bottom, you'll see that there is a tab for instructions. That's primarily letting you know how we use the spreadsheets. It's also um, reminding you that this is not really a place to um, personalize the spreadsheet. So we don't really recommend moving columns around or renaming things. If there does, there's a desire to capture additional metadata, we recognize we recommend that happens in a different spreadsheet to keep the purpose of um, content for circle separate from other goals. And then there is the header that lets you know what the names of the columns are. And that's loosely connected to the labels that you'll see in the item records. A couple of other signposts are when we use terms like required or optional. So required means that you cannot create an item record if this is empty. Our, our repository won't allow it, and it's also not recommended because it doesn't make good item records. Um, so required means you have to put something in there. Optional means you can if you like. In this uh, row here, we're providing prompts um, to get you thinking about what belongs in these uh, sections. And the idea is that the answers to these questions becomes your metadata. You'll also see that there are two rows that have examples um, that we've gotten from pre-existing records. So you can see the building blocks of those different metadata elements. At the end of the spreadsheet is a link to the item record. So you can compare what that looks like um, from data entry and then what that looks like in, um, in actuality. Uh, you can always erase those examples as you're populating your metadata. It's just there as kind of a, a guide or a signpost. So if we go back to those building blocks of data plus metadata, we can see how a circle item record is built. So um, the beginning of the process is um, creating and selecting your data. So as um, Anne will talk about a little bit more about what that process is like, you can have multiple files associated with one item record. The goal is just that they all kind of belong together in a logical manner. So an example might be, multiple angles of a similar structure, but the quality of the data is up to the selectors. So if you have duplicate images or multiple images, you wanna try and select the best one. Blurry images might not actually um, be helpful to other people who are coming across this content. And that's part of where the planning I think comes from and the selection process. So not all images are gonna be relevant or needed just because you have them, they may not actually be um, representative of what you want in your item records. So I'm going to break it down and focus on a couple of the fields that tend to be the most challenging, I find, um, because a lot of the metadata process that we're used to is generally really strict. As I mentioned, it's, it's with publications, so someone else is telling you what fields or how to populate the fields. The description field is technically optional in DSpace. You can fill it in or not. For Frogbear, we've make it, made it required because without it, the objects don't really have any context. So it's important to really think mindfully and to really describe what it is that we're seeing and why it's relevant. And I think the primary goal is to make that translatable and relevant to a diverse range of audiences. Um, so 
imagine you're writing for people who are not wholly familiar with the material. And that's a good place to start is just simply answering those who, what, when, where, why questions. Um, again, circle staff, we're not subject matter experts. So we're not really looking at the um, intellectual content of the material in this field. What we're more looking at is, um, is it sort of, is there a logical flow? Are there any um, severe grammatical er uh, errors that might actually impact um, someone's ability to understand the content? Does uh, what's represented there actually reflect the object that's part of the item record? But we're not really looking at the intellectual content. We're relying on the subject matter experts to do that piece. Just gonna take a glass of water. So the rules for data entry for this field are simply that you have to put something in there. Uh, we recommend that um, people generally spend the most time here because it's the most valuable section and it tends to be the most challenging to get right. And as we mentioned, it's essential because it provides that really important context. So this is what it looks like uh, in an item record. And you can see how without that, you wouldn't really know what you were looking at. Uh, the title, as you can imagine, is pretty important as well. Um, unpublished items have titles that are supplied by the content creators. Um, artifacts or sites, though, might have names that they already go by and are known as. And so you can use those names to describe, um, to, to put in the title field of your item record, because you know that other people will know it by that name, and that will make it easily findable. Uh, because our repository is in uh, a North American context, most of our material is in English primarily. So we recommend there's at least uh, an English title. But there are other versions of that title that um, are important for people who are trying to find this material. Uh, as we'll mention quite a few times, you can have multiple items grouped under a single title. You just want them to kind of logically belong together. And that's what it looks like in um, Front Fair database. Subject keywords are a little bit trickier. Um, you might notice in the library catalog, these tend to be very formalized. In a library catalog, we have external standards, usually the Library of Congress, that gives us a set amount of keywords that um, it's really someone it generally is an expert in how to apply those keywords. Circle doesn't standardize this field. In fact, in Circle, uh, in our database, it's optional. Um, again, just because of the nature of the content. So it's really up to the people creating the metadata to create good subject keywords. So for us, the rules for data entry are fairly loose, but we do recommend that there are at least three to five solid subjects. Um, more is fine as long as they're quality, but you have to be careful about being so broad that it actually becomes not useful for someone who's trying to find a specific object. So um, ideally, we were hinting at this um, in reference to Matilda's question, ideally that there is some planning and conversation happening with the clusters potentially to create a list of topics that are applied or that um, teams are being really uh, intentional about these subject keywords to make sure that if uh, they were searching for this material, it would be easy for them to find as well. And it's important because it helps to identify topics of interest. But one of the things is um, about circle is that any text that's in the object or in the record is full text searchable. So if you type it into Google, if you type it into the search box, any terms, you'll find it. The subject keyword is related to a specific field. So it's really designed for a filtered targeted search. But um, if you put terms in the description field, those will be searchable by anyone typing those into the keyword. It's really just the subject keywords uh, field that you'll see in the, in the frog bear record that are in this category. But you'll, if you're looking for anything that appears in the descriptive field, you'll find it with just a keyword search just by typing. Uh, geographic location and that long. Again, as you can imagine, because we deal primarily with published materials, this is not a standardized field for circle. So we've begun to use it more because it has uh, direct dependency for frog bear's goals. Uh, what we say is generally it should be about a specific location. Um, generally, there should be one lat, lat and what long figure and that those should be in decimal form. 
And um, in the wiki guides, the, I've provided some links to some tools that can help that. And I think Anne's gonna explore this a little bit more in depth, but it's important because it creates that specificity and context for the content. And it also populates that database mapping tool. And that's what it looks like in the frog bear. So um, going back to those building blocks, what the metadata is really helping us to do is to create kind of an, a consistent experience across multiple platforms. So one of the primary goals of an open access repository is interoperability. Can we work with other platforms? Can our content be, be reused? And that means we have to be very intentional about what we capture and how we capture it. So this is what um, an item record looks like uh, DSpace administrator's point of view. That's what it looks like currently in Open Collections. I can tell you that at the end of July, this should look very different. Our team is rebuilding this item record page to try to create, um, try to make it easier to see the download links at the very top of the page. We're trying to make the DOI more prominent and the item metadata more visible. So um, if you're looking at this at the end of July, it will, it should look a little bit different I'm assuming that our testing goes well. And that's what that same record looks like in the frog bear. So um, I am gonna make my presentation available, but um, a couple of resources I wanna to point to specifically that are really helpful. The first one is a presentation from our research commons team. That's about metadata in general. So if you really wanna explore the basic concepts of metadata more fulsomely and how it might apply to other projects, I highly recommend the resources there. We've also got a link to the wiki, which we're, um, I'm very happy to have feedback to see if this is actually helpful for people using it to, to do this work. And I'm very open to suggestions for making this better. And um, I've got a link to the um, entire Frogbear collection in circle there. And that's just um, our team. So, you know, uh, I like to make the faces behind the, uh, the work more visible to you. And I think that's it for me. Let's move to Anne, who's gonna talk more about the mechanics of data collection actually in the field, because Anne is um, a PhD student at the University of Saskatchewan, and she has been um, on a few field visits before, so she can speak directly from her experience. So, Anne, I will pass it over to you. Yes, thank you very much, Vicki. And thank you everyone who woke up early or stayed up late to attend today. Um, it's greatly appreciated to have so many people interested in this process. Um, so I'm just going to share my screen quickly here with everyone. Uh, so yes, the mechanics of field work. So I'm going to sort of slowly walk through an example from Jingshan Temple um, in China that I uh, collected some data for in 2019. Um, and sort of, we've talked a lot about sort of the end result, these wonderful, wonderful databases and online resources that are the product of our field work. But what does our field work actually look like? And how do you do that? Um, it's a big question that hopefully I can answer for you all today. So what we're just a brief overview. Um, this example comes from cluster 2.2 uh, that took place in China in 2019. We're gonna cover quickly the process of taking photos and data collection in the field. How do you then take your notes and your photos and actually make it into the metadata based on the template that Tara has showed us? Um, and then Again, we should now be more familiar with the end result of the Frogbear database and UBC Open Collections. So the very first thing I suggest is to know your background information. And this will also help answer previous questions about, you know, what do you even take photos of? What do you even collect when you're collecting data? So for the most part, your clusters themselves will have a research area or a research goal of some sort um, or a research question. And so make sure that everyone involved in the cluster is aware of what these goals are, because this will help determine what type of things you're photographing and what type of information about you know, these objects or these sites you want to be collecting. 
So for cluster 2.2, we had a very strong sort of research question, research goal in mind. Particularly, we were looking at um, text or this idea of canons and the history of um, Buddhist text, either you know in its original formation, in its recreation, in its preservation. How are canons or textual materials being maintained and preserved? Is sort of the main goal. How can how can we record this? So this is sort of like the the background guiding goal as we entered into the field in China. And every cluster should have a description like this that you should be well aware of. Um, the other thing too is some cluster leaders hopefully will provide background reading materials, journal articles, books, whatever, um, that most participants can familiarize themselves with before they even get to the field. So if you are offered those resources, I highly encourage you to read them. Um, Next, you know, you'll show up to your site, either, you know, you're at a temple, you're in a library, you're just walking around the streets, uh, wherever you are, um, and you come to the place where this is where we want to collect data. Um, the, what I found works best is to break down into smaller groups, either pairs or groups of three, um, and assign roles where you have someone who's the photographer, someone who's the note taker, um, and then someone who can translate or read or measure, depending on you know, the type of object or material you're looking at. Uh, and essentially, you'll have someone taking photos and describing things and someone frantically writing down, jotting down what we're looking at, um, taking notes of you know, which photos correspond to which angle or which object, so that when you go back at the end of the day to translate this into your um, spreadsheet, you know what these photos are that I took, right? The other thing you need to do, which I highly suggest, is to make a game plan. Decide what to photograph and how. So if you're at a temple site, walk through initially with your small group and have a discussion ahead of time. What should we be photographing? How should we be photographing? Are there any barriers to our ability to take pictures or to collect data? Are we able to overcome those barriers or do we have to shift our game plan to make collection possible? So I've included a few photos in this slide to give you a bit of an example. One of them is a pagoda in Chaoyang in uh, Northeast China. And it was sort of the main goal of our cluster to go to Chaoyang and to visit this pagoda because you can actually go inside where they have allegedly <laughs> um, stone inscriptions inside in the little museum. Lo and behold, our cluster arrives and it's closed to visitors because it's under construction and the whole thing is covered in scaffolding. And there are detailed motifs on the side of this pagoda that have been carved in there, images of the Buddha and all sorts of cool stuff that we couldn't actually see or photograph. Um, so we sort of had to reshape our approach to how do we collect data about this site when it's not actually you know, what we thought it would be. Um, but that being said, because the goal of this uh, cluster in particular was to focus on how are, you know, how is the canon um, maintained over time and recreated over time? Well, here's a snapshot of the reality of, you know, images of Buddhism or stories of related to the Buddha um, that are being preserved. And this is how we are attempting to preserve Buddhism in the 21st century by, you know, obviously taking care of these buildings and these pagodas in this history. Um, so this is part of a historical narrative and just because we couldn't go in and see it doesn't mean that it's not valuable to still collect that data as it exists in the real world. Um, the other issue that mostly I think would be most common for people is you're in a public space and you want to take photos of things but there are people in the background right these if you're in a temple site there's active people worshiping there participating in religion um, or just tourists milling about in general um, so you have to be cognizant of you know how you're taking photos to sort of protect the privacy of individuals i know that the library does have the ability to blur faces um, because we're publishing these materials open access, you have to be cognizant of the consent of individuals who may be in these videos or in these photos. And I think that 
Tara maybe can speak a little bit more about this later if other people have more questions. So this all comes into play of, you know, have a plan so that when you start photographing, you're not delayed by dealing with issues that you may run into. Number four. All right, so location information, very important. Obviously record your dates, record your site names. This, if you're starting to photograph an object, you know, what is this object? If there's a text, you know what the name of the text is. Um, record any languages that any text or inscriptions may be in. These are obviously information that you will need to translate later into the metadata sheet itself. Um, but in the field, if you can identify these things while you're there, this is where you need to have your note taker work really hard or your translator work really hard um, to identify these things while you're in the field and while you have tangible access to them. The biggest thing that we need to always remember to do is to get our geographic coordinates. Um, and this can be tricky. The best way that I've found to do it is, thankfully, we all have a compass in our pockets. Uh, and I know on an iPhone, even if you're out of the service area and you don't have access to data, um, you can see in the screenshot, I took this um, on my own phone, I'm in airplane mode and my compass still works. Um, and so what I do when I'm photographing an object or a site or a location is I stand in front of it and I open up my phone and I take a screenshot of my compass because it gives me the direct coordinates in degrees as well as the date and time, right? Helpful information. Um, and then the, the task at the end of the day when we're translating this into our metadata template, our spreadsheet, is to just convert the degrees uh, into a decimal. And that's something I'll speak about briefly in a second as well. Um, so collect your location information. Oftentimes you, you're not going back to this site. Um, and so it's really hard to collect this stuff after the fact. So you, um, use a checklist maybe is another um, helpful tip of all of these location things that you should be collecting while you're in the field. And then there's the task of actually taking the photographs and actually taking the notes. Um, so here is an example from Jingshan Temple. This is a sutra or a Dharani pillar, um, one of two matching twin Dharani pillars. Um, and this is a record that you know I collected the photos and created the metadata for, and it's now on the um, website um, in, in the UBC library. So an example, um, you know, it's an eight sided pillar. Uh, I decided to take four photos. So I get a clear shot of each side. So if someone were to want to read this Dharani, um, it's a clear enough photograph that they can zoom in and they can read the text itself. Um, and you get a perspective of how tall it is and what shape it is and all that fun stuff. Um, and so here's a, a bit of an example of, well, what do my notes look like that are attached the, to this, these photos that I took? Um, so describe what it is. Uh, it's one of two, two pillars. This is the right side one at the entrance of Jingshan Temple. So this is generally where it's located. Um, here is my description of the four photos going clockwise, and I've included my file numbers in my notes. Uh, and then any other discernible information. It's in Chinese language, it's a Dharani. Here's part of the title. And so once I'm you know, back in the hotel or back working with my cluster group at the end of the day, when we're working with our spreadsheet, I have this general information. And if I wanna learn more um, about this Dharani, I can then you know, search on Baidu or search on Google and find additional information, but I have part of its title. So now it's searchable for me after the fact. And so that's generally, you know, the walkthrough of the process while you're in the field. Um, and after, I highly recommend that you do your metadata um, creation in the template the same day that you visit that site in the field. Um, the information will be fresh in your mind, you'll know, and I find this has been a real life experience that if you put off creating the metadata, after you've gone to the site, it won't get done. You have to do it all in one day or the next day because as soon as the cluster ends and everybody goes home, 
you can't work in pairs and you can't generate this metadata very easily. And oftentimes it doesn't end up happening and then you know our efforts are wasted. Um, so reconvene with your cluster and with your small group that you worked in at the end of the day and input all of this additional information into the spreadsheet. Uh, the first thing you need to do is that general participant information. So here is an example for Jing Shan that I did. Um, obviously this is stuff that is easily, easily done. Um, cluster name, your name, the name of anyone who was in that small group. Um, easy, pretty straightforward. Input your file names. So this is something that um, Tara touched upon. So your file documents, the photos, the, yes, the photos. Um, so for this pillar, there were two of them, twins, and I took four photos of each. So this entry within the template has eight files attached to it. And I've included all of those names there. Um, some people I know like to rename those files just to make it easier for you to deal with, you know, all of these pictures and things that you're trying to organize on your computers, other people's computers. Um, and so I know people have renamed things, you know, Darny Pillar 1.1.2.3.4 um, to make things more easier, but find what works for you, find what makes the most sense for everyone in your cluster to understand. Um, and hopefully that can be, you know, streamlined across across your group so everything you're producing is the same is consistent uh, the other thing bit is add your location information so here we're going to obviously name we have the name of the object so i took multiple photos of different things around Jin, jingshan temple in general and what i ended up doing was creating multiple entries on the same spreadsheet of objects and items inside the temple. So I named it, you know, Jing Shan Temple, Twin Dharani Pillar One, because there were two different sets of Dharani Pillars. There was also a nine dragon wall at the back of one of uh, the main halls. I've included photos of that. Um, and then your date, obviously your location information and the very important latitude and longitude as converted into decimals. We cannot have them in degrees. Um, so you'll notice at the bottom of the template here, there is the instruction tab. If you click there, um, there are some helpful links to the wiki guides and things that Tara had mentioned about how to and why can, we need to convert these things into decimals. Um, also a quick Google search or a Baidu search on you know, a, a converter from decimal or degree to decimal, a lot of those exist online. You can find them quite easily and you can input your numbers and it'll generate that for you automatically. Uh, the last thing, and I think one of the most important things aside from your location information is to work with your cluster leader and other members in your cluster on determining your subject terms and your description of your items and your entry. And so what I've done, um, for this subject here is I'm in the same site, but I'm taking pictures of multiple things within this site. So the first three or four terms um, for my, my subjects uh, are repeated, right? I'm in China, this is a Buddhist site, it's Jinshan Temple. What I'm looking at is, yeah, those are the sort of the repeatable terms. And then I get a little more specific for the actual object that I'm looking at. And some of the things that you can describe is, you know, what's the material that this is made out of? Is this a stone object? Is it wood? Is it, you know, paper? Um, is it a manuscript? You know, what's the physical description of, of the object that I'm looking at? Um, so in this case, it's stone, it's a darning pillar. Um, and then try to get a bit more specific. So go from general to specific. So here, I actually know the Dharani that's on this pillar. And that is a really great term to give, you know, specific detail if anyone's, you know, doing research on Dharanis or interested in the Da Bei Zhou or, or Guan Yin for that matter. Um, the other thing is the description. So here, uh, the first three, four lines, are general descriptions of the temple itself. So basic history, um, when was this temple built? When was it popular? If you know, you know, the sect of Buddhism it's associated with, that sort of information can be included, as well as more current knowledge about, you know, this temple was recently reconstructed and a lot of it is new. 
Um, and then the last few sentences in my description are more specific about that object in general. So this is a description of the Dharani. I know the name of it. Here is a reference to its entry in the Taisho canon. Anyone else, you know, who is doing research or studies in, you know, Buddhist texts now can have a, a, a thorough reference to what this Dharani is and where it comes from. And you'll notice that this material, again, is um, some of this information in the description can be repeatable if you are including multiple entries for the same location. So because I have two Dharani pillars located at the same temple, I've included the same information multiple times, right? So some of this stuff you can reuse. And then again, it's just the bottom more detailed information at the end of the description that's particular to the actual object itself. Uh, and as I've said, uh, we can include multiple entries of objects um, on the same metadata sheet. So this works really well when you're working with, you know, a temple site, someplace large, where there are multiple objects that you can be photographing, but you don't want to make, you know, a different spreadsheet for every single thing, because they're all somewhat related. Um, if I were to go to a different temple and photograph a sutra pillar or a dharani pillar, um, I'm in a different location, so I would make a different spreadsheet separate for the metadata for those two sites, if that makes sense. Uh, the other thing, too, which hopefully this is a helpful thing that the library appreciates, is for very large sites, like a, a large temple complex like Jingshan is, um, you can get even more precise location data as you move around, because this whole site is on the side of a mountain. So some things are slightly in a slightly different location than other places. Um, and again, when you're translating your coordinate data from de uh, degrees to decimals, include the whole number. We want to be as specific as possible here so that anyone who wants to take this geographic data and use it for whatever they want, their other purposes, that they'll be getting specific information and they can be precise in you know, whatever research they're attempting to, to pull from the metadata that we create. And so as just as a review, six steps that are hopefully helpful in the field is to know your background information, right? Know what your cluster goal is, work in small pairs or groups and assign roles. I think this is really key to actually being fruitful in your collection in the field. Um, decide what you're photographing, decide what objects or texts or images uh, you wanna create and make a plan for how to do that. Identify barriers you might come into contact with uh, and then collect any local information you possibly have access to. Uh, one helpful tip is that when you're in temple sites for the most part are looking at um, in public spaces, particularly in, in China and in East Asia, um, they like to put up little plaques <laughs> and take photos of these plaques. If this temple has been rebuilt, likely there's going to be a plaque there telling you when it was originally built and who funded it and when it was rebuilt and who funded it. And this information can be useful and it can be translated into our metadata. Um, and again, take your photos, take your notes and work with your cluster at the end of the day to come up with those useful keywords and descriptions. Um, and obviously the end results are the Frog Bear database online as well as uh, the UBC Open Library, which we've already seen multiple examples of. Um, and so if you have any questions or concerns, we'll open it up to questions now, but you can also always um, email me at any point in time, and I'd be more than happy to give you advice or answer any questions. I would yeah, really hope that if you have any feedback on both this sort of process here, um, but also the process that we've been talking about, um, the material we've produced, the training, the documentation, um, what was challenging, um, what was unclear, uh, we really welcome. Um, at any stage, so especially if you're participating in the future in any of the cluster visits, um, whether you're coming back from them or even especially as you're preparing for them, 
uh, feel free to email um, anytime to uh, check in um, and um, ask for clarification. Um, and likewise, you know, if you're not participating directly in Frogbear activities, but you have um, any kind of you know related projects. Um, you know, let us know if this was helpful or um, relevant for thinking about how to structure metadata, but also for thinking about, you know, in the future, um, integrating material from Frogbear with other things, um, because ultimately that's one of our goals too, is that this won't just live by itself, but um, will inspire people to do additional work. Um, so thank you all for spending three hours, some of you very, very early, some of you uh, uh, so little later um, all over the world. And um, I hope you'll participate in more uh, Frogbear activities. Um, I know some of you are in the, over the rest of the summer and uh, in future years. So thanks everyone.